Right, we may as well kick off those. Uh, there'll still be uh, people uh, popping on, no doubt, over the next few minutes. Um, it's these days on uh, on these calls, it's uh, almost as bad as uh, when we get together in real life and there was a train from some remote part of the country a few minutes late and um, people used to uh, wander in for the first 10 minutes. So uh, it brings back all sorts of memories. Um, when we were allowed to do things like that. Um, so, um, introductions first. Um, if we go around the table, Adrian. <laughs> hi there. Sorry, just trying to find the window. Um, hi, my name's Adrian Falconer. I'm the product owner for the redevelopment of Naptan. I'm here today just to do a quick um, talk about that for a few minutes. Um, I'm from the Department for Transport. Um, Alex? Is that what you were hoping for, by the way, Tim? Cause... <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well <laughs> yeah, I'm not as good as Dr. Jay at this. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what the questions were. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Alex? Hi, I'm Alex, and I work for a company called Passenger. Um. A.M. I don't know who beyond A.M. you are. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to unmute there. Took a bit of time. Hi, it's Anne Harrod Murray um, from Suffolk County Council. Yeah. Um, Dan Saunders. Hi, yeah, Dan Saunders uh, from Facemap. I'm head of products there. Thank you. Uh, David Batchelor. David Batchelor from Tikita, operator support. Di. Hi, Di Wright from Connect Cheese Valley. Uh, Dr. J. Hey, I'm Dr. J. I use they as a pronoun. I'm from ThoughtWorks, who are a consultancy, and I'm currently working for Department for Transport as a service designer. Um, Ian. Barrett, yeah. No, he's just arrived. Uh, we've got him twice. Dual personality. While we wait for him to sort his uh, self out, John Carr. Uh, John Carr representing ATCO. Um, John Whitfield. Hi, uh, John Whitfield, Omnibus. Okay. Jonathan Raper. Yeah, hi folks, Jonathan Raper, Transport API. Uh, Josh Goodwin. Hi, uh, Josh Goodwin from bustimes.org. Uh, Justin. Justin Bloom, Fix Technology. Uh, Kalyani. Hello, Kalyani Hongberg Desai from Basemap. I work here as a software developer. Thank you. Uh, Keith. Keith Willis, yes, from React, if he's not, microphone's not working. Yeah, Kim? Kim Harper, Durham County Council Information Team Leader. Okay, Mark Jones. Hi, good afternoon, Mark from EPM, product owner. Okay, Mark Taylor. Uh, Staffordshire County Council. Okay. Uh, Mira. Yeah, we'll hear from Mira. Oh, yeah, hello. Oh, hi, oh. sorry, I just created a question here and I'm going to meet. Hi, Mira from Department of Transport and I head up the passenger experience team and we cover passenger information. Uh, Mike Baxter. Hi there, Mike Baxter from Leicester City Council, uh, Transport Development Officer. Uh, Nick. Nick Carey from Waysphere. We design um, local authority, regional authority, bus RTI systems. Okay, Paul Everson. Uh, Paul Everson from Peace. Uh, Peter Stoner. Peter Stoner from Eto World. Apologise, I'll have to uh, leave for another meeting at some stage. 
Okay, uh, Richard Mason. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Richard Mason, TFN. Uh, Rob. Rob West, founder of Illidium. Um, we're building tools and services to create and use bus open data. Uh, Teresa. Hi, uh, Teresa Jolly. Um, I don't know what I am. I'm taking notes anyway. Me too. <laughs> uh, and Tricia. Tricia Wright from Nottinghamshire County Council. Okay, and I think uh, Amy. Hi, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I was a couple of minutes late. Uh, Amy Brown from Travel Line. Um, and then Graham. And Graham Brown from West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Okay, excellent. I think that's everybody. If you've not had your say of who you are, then speak now or forever hold your peace. Yep. Okay. Um, so um, I've not had any apologies from anybody for today. Um, no. Okay, so um, minutes of the last meeting from the 3rd of December. Um, if there's anything um, inaccurate with them, um, shout out. Um, otherwise, um, we'll go through the actions. Um, only a couple this time. Um, uh, there was an action for people to get into touch with Rob West or myself um, if you were interested in NAPTAN tools. Um, I don't know whether um, you've uh, had any uh, interest, Rob? Uh, no, not really. Didn't hear a, a great deal from anybody. I think events sort of overtook us a little bit, obviously, with the extension of the, um, the ETO tools. Um, but uh, I'm sure we'll come to that later in the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Um, then on stop announcements, um, I did get some feedback from people that um, had put um, audio and visual equipment on buses and some feedback. And we had a survey that went fairly widespread and we got some good uh, results. Um, and input from that into the um, uh, project with the DFT, looking at um, the accessible regulations. Um, so thank you for that. And then um, there was a question about um, agent mode in BODS. Um, and uh, Kim, I think you were going to talk to Murray and the DFT um for more information about that so hopefully he's uh, given you the information that you need and you'll sort it out okay um first um topic for today um is naptan um and the naptan project that the uh, department of transport are um, running at the moment, um, and we've got um, Dr. Jay Harrison and uh, Adrian Faulkner from the DFT on to bring us up to speed with where they are and what we've what they've been doing. Um, you, those of you on the um, PTIC mailing list will have had lots of spam over the last um, couple of months as lots of events have been being organised and things like that. And uh, it's been a good turnout to a lot of them. So um, uh, thank you for that. But uh, yeah, Dr. Jay and Adrian, over to you. Oh, uh, thank you. I'm going to go first. Uh, and I didn't turn on screen sharing first off. Just bear with me here two seconds while I fight with... Um, the Mac permissions to get go to meeting have have permissions to share. Just bear with me here two seconds. I was trying to do that subtly in the background. Um, it now wants to restart. I will be back in a second. Adrian, do you want to quickly fill in while I while I appear back? And hopefully you have done the thing that I didn't do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I'm happy to talk. 
now I'm worried that this isn't going to work for me either, but I, I think. Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to mess with the with format a little bit and just talk a little bit about what we've been doing, because I know we've been working on this for a little while now, and we've been having lots of public meetings and sort of seeming really busy, but there probably hasn't been a huge amount of output that we've we've come back to share with you. Um, and I just wanted to to sort of start doing that a little bit now and let you know where we're going this year. Uh, and I think Jay's going to then talk about some of the public meetings and how to get involved and what we've been talking about in those. Um, we've been trying to put together a bit of a strategy, and I don't know how well, um, how I don't know if you're like me and have got a bad eyesight and a really small screen, then it's probably uh, not that helpful in terms of zooming in. But I'll just take you through at a high level what we've been talking about. Um, because we wanted to put together a strategy to help us look into the future to see, you know, how in the future, how do we see Naptan being used to help us to really understand. Um, you know, what sort of things we needed to be building in from the start to make sure that, you know, we didn't do something that precluded something from happening later on. Um, and, you know, we're part of the wider bus open data work and we're all aiming towards a sort of increased public transport usage, um, which is sort of the end goal over here. Um, and then going back to the start, you know, working at, when it's 2025, we've got people who are data producers, who are using Naptan, producing Naptan data. Um, and putting that into a system, um, and there's, you know, we we recognise there's a lot of different uh, transport data things out there, um, and we sort of seem to be at the centre of them. So you know, there's things like Naptan, there's boards, the Street Manager, um, and there's a lot of this information going into the sort of central DFT space. So we want to be able to take data from data producers, ideally automatically, and putting it into that wider space, and then being able to push that out again automatically, potentially through an API or whatever tool makes sense at the time uh, to consumers who can use that data to produce the things that actually people see at the other end. Um, and it's kind of a very high level view of what we want to do, but in, in starting to produce that view, we, we start to get the idea of, well, what's important to us now and what's going to be important to us in the future. Um, so there's quite a few things that we um, that are qu quite key to us in terms of the idea of being able to do something automatically that can you know, so if you are out on the street changing a stop or making some changes to a stop or noting that something's not quite right, you can make the correction in your system. And that that one change could be automatically pushed through the whole system. Um, that, so that's guided a lot of our thinking in terms of how do we need to start to set this up. But also we we look at the things like street manager where, you know, if there's information coming in about a road being dug up that potentially affects a, a road. Uh, you know, the, the public transport down that road. In the future, you know, we've got all this data within the Department of Transport. How are we using that to make sure that if someone does um, dig up the road, they, that they're aware that that affects two bus stops and perhaps there's somebody else that might need to know about that and perhaps that can be passed on automatically. So I should say this is really a uh, high level strategy for a long time in the future. Right now, 2025 seems like a long time in the future. Um, I don't know about you, that time is passing quite slowly in the homeschool world. Um, but there's also a number of other things that were really key to us in terms of, well, at, at that point, we really want to be dealing properly with accessibility data. And what does that mean in terms of actually we probably need an accessibility standard across the different tools that are looking at, at transport data. So we need to start to pull together a, a more holistic view of, of accessibility data so that we're all sort of saying the same thing across the industry. Um, things on business rules, there's a lot of different different business rules on Naptan data particularly. And so what can we do to try and consolidate all those and get a, a clear set of, of rules that we all agree with are, are, are correct. Um, one of the big things is there's three different schemas or four different schemas that are kind of around there at the moment. And that's a real distraction to us because actually we're not really sure that people could produce data to a 2.5 schema and getting a schema change and the information together would be really difficult. And so we've said that in the future, we would like to move to uh, you know an updated version of the schema that everyone's happy with that includes accessibility data and all these things. But right now, we're just going to focus on 2.1 because that's the one that everybody's using, and we want to get that right. Conscious that in the future, we want to move we want to move to this point where we can actually retire support for 2.1 and 2.4 because we've we've moved on to something that is the future thing. Not saying what that is, we have no pre-fixed ideas of what that's going to be, but we recognise in the future there will be perhaps something different that we're all working to. Um, all of this will be guided by research and, uh, you know, hopefully discussions with, with the industry to understand where we need to go with that. And then there's some other things around uh, transparency, around how we can report stops that are perhaps 
don't have the correct information and making sure that that goes to the right person and some things around ownership of the data. So allowing anybody to be able to update stop data for NAPTAN for all the stops that they own without having to come to the Department of Transport to perhaps do tube stops or, or, or tram stops. Um, and then, oh, excuse me, and then we've got some stuff around. We, just making sure that the back office is set up properly. So we've got lots of different teams that are involved in some way in, in sort of transport data and NAPTAN data, just to make sure we've got a clear support team, an operational team, and, and a policy team that are all working together to to you know for the same outcomes, so that we can give you a clear message to the you know in terms of the industry uh, about about what we're trying to do. Um, so at a high level, that's what we we you know we see the future. But as I said, that's a long way away, and. At the moment, we're just trying to deal with what we've got right now and, and how do we move that on. So we've been working for the last sort of six months, four months, sorry, with uh, ThoughtWorks to start to build um, something that will be the you know the bedrock of the of the new system, um, and come up with a bit of a plan about how we how we sort of move through the next year. Um, we've got three stages we sort of see this year um, in terms of three releases that we're looking at doing. Um, the first one being a um, just looking at download, can we get can we improve the download? Can we do a new version of the download of, of NAP10 data? Uh, the second release being, can we look at upload and, and, and see how we might want to change that? Um, all of this in a sort of uh, an MVP, a minimum viable product uh, type approach. So not looking at doing touching APIs or anything like that in, in this period. Um, and in the second release, also looking at identity or creating accounts and how we manage account management and permissions. And then in the sort of release three, looking at how we start to tackle with NPTG, because we recognize the importance of, of the right decisions in that space, and then starting to think about how we how we can do some overall migration um, of, the, of the service. Um, so that's kind of the plan for the year in terms of um, what that actually means for, um, for, for the people on the call and industry generally, we're really interested in looking in sorting out the download in this first release just because to do that it means that we have to look at how we store the files we need to look at how we do the validation to create that sort of journey of, of information coming through um, and we're interested to see if we, we can recreate that and actually produce a download that is is useful to people um, and we felt that would be a nice easy first step for us to do to be able to show to to you that we are doing the right things and we can produce something that that works for you um so in the next three months we're sort of talking about that taking up until um, early april um we'll be building the things that um, enable us to do that and looking to start to test that with um with with people in as much of a real life setting as possible so we'll be able to produce the website that you can download something from and we'd be interested to see how you know how that how that features in your systems um and then moving on from that when we get into sort of april into the summer we'll be looking to repeat the same process but look at how we can bring on the upload and sort of the account creation and account management processes for a new naptan service um and again we will work very closely with you um, I'm sure some of you have been to Dr. Jay's excellent public meetings, but you know we're hoping to try and take a very consultative approach, make sure we're open and transparent, so you can see where we're going um, with these things and have opportunity to provide feedback into it. Um, but the, yeah, the, so the second phase from April into the summer, we'll be looking at how we do the upload and identity um, and, and testing that with people before we then start to move into the sort of final phases. Um, I'm going to pause there. And either pass on to Jay or ask for questions. I think if we pass on maybe and then come to questions at the end. That's totally fine with me. I should now be set yeah. up to share. Let me just take a stab in the dark. And Windows beats Mac every time, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hopefully this is what you're all seeing. Right. Perfect. What I wanted what I wanted to do is just give a very quick rundown of what we've done to make sure that everyone was aware of where to get the recordings, what we've got planned over the next month or so before the next one of these meetings and sort of some of the key outcomes and also some of the next steps that we're taking, which uh, Adrian's already touched on one of them. So or both of them. So it's going to be quite mine is going to be quite quick. Um, we've done nine meetings so far. Um, they're all recorded and they're all available up on the RTIG um, 
YouTube channel apart from one where we focused on the CSV files and quite frankly that was so detailed and so dull oh no it wasn't dull but it was so detailed we decided that it was best not to publicize it um, because we just kept diving deep into detail which was brilliant in so many ways but it's just not really for public consumption um, so if you want to go and have a look at what we've done this is the information that I've been taking and we've been taking to kind of build out some key findings um, the public meetings that we've got planned, we've, we're, we're doing the one today right now. There's one coming up tomorrow on the 23rd, which is around business rules and data quality. Um, and then there's one on Thursday for the data consumers. So we're wanting to talk to people who consume the data and we're going to run across a whole pile of different questions that we've got and just really trying to understand a lot more about your journey, what it looks like. Um, we also have had um, pardon me, a meeting with the bus operators and one of the things that, it, that came out of that was we need to do a lot more playbacks and a lot more talking about strategies and what next for NAPTAN and how it fits into everything else and those changes that are coming up. So we're going to do a session like that in March and there'll possibly see, be some more technical working groups that we need to run in that time if we've got questions that are still unanswered that have come out of these ones, and this has been one of the things, every time we kind of open the box and dig down, because honestly, NAPTAN sounds so simple. Put data in, look at data, pull data out. It doesn't feel complex until you start digging into the details and then you uncover just all the little complexities around. So this is about just constantly digging down and finding those complexities and thinking about what are the most valuable ones to track at this point in time. So giving you a couple of the key findings that have come out. Um, I know this sounds ridiculous, but we actually sat down and asked everyone, what is a bus stop? And one of the best answers that we forgot is a bus stop is where a bus stops. And we thought this was just like the best definition of what a bus stop is because it allows for the hail and ride, the custom bus stops, all the different natures of bus stops and pulls them together into one definition um, because it's got nothing about poles or anything like that. And it allows us to kind of really start to conceptualize where we've got to move from and what, what we need to record and what we need to put together. Um, one of the things that we have uncovered for local authorities <clears throat> is that Downloading local authority data for, for neighboring, neighboring local authorities is a key activity for both data producers and data consumers. It's those boundaries that are really, really important. It's the bus routes that cross two or three, that, that cross a boundary two or three times. Um, it's the buses out to Blackpool Airport, where if you travel in one way, they're with one local transport authority and traveling the other way, they're with another, and yet they're both running on the same route. Just making sure that all of those pieces are kind of thought about and put together. Um, we've discovered that CSV files is the most used file types. So this is the one that everyone seems to want to download much more than XML. Um, and within that, there is one file that everyone seems to love or love, um, which is stops.csv. So we're doing a little bit of deep diving into how we put that together and how we produce that and make sure that that's the best quality for everybody. Um, the last one is accessibility is complex data to understand and no one's ready to really produce or consume it yet. There are pieces of it coming through. It's really understanding how all, all that accessibility data fits together. Having an accessible bus stop at a stop that it can kneel at and deposit a wheelchair at, but there is no footpaths for the next mile and a half doesn't really express the accessibility of that bus stop. So it's trying to think about how to do something like that and how to measure something like that, which is a really tricky, complicated problem that's going to take a long time to solve. We're not expecting to solve this one overnight. Um, so taking a quick breath, really quickly, the next steps, we're doing a lot more user research in the coming months. So we want to get to know all of our users intimately. We know there's less than 200 people who are actively producing or consuming the data. So one of the goals that I've given to the user research team is to get to know every single person who's doing that as closely as we can. So I really appreciate all of your patience for um, your willingness to spend time with us, just allowing us to really understand 
how you're producing or consuming the data. Now, one of the reasons for doing that is every single person is is like an edge case. We don't have a huge population that are doing pretty much similar with edge cases everywhere. It's different for everybody and we want to make sure that we allow for all of those differences in the way that we build and the way that we think about this. If we get too focused on the urbans, on the urban centers, if we get too focused on the big mens users, that's going to limit us being able to roll out wider in the future. So that's a lot of what we're looking at there. And as Adrian talked about with the strategy, we're looking at the highest value things to do next. So one of the reasons that we're doing a lot of this talking and consulting is really understanding what are the best things to do next? What's gonna deliver the most bang for buck? Um, because it's no use us making something that doesn't really give everybody what they need, that doesn't really push it forward. So I'm gonna stop there for a breath and I think Adrian and I can answer any questions on this. And I hope to see some of you, I'm gonna drop off after this by the way, and I'll hope to see some of you at the meeting tomorrow. Yep. Thank you both of you. Um, are there any questions from anybody? We can't have given all of the answers. I didn't use 42 once. <laughs> Can I ask a question about accessibility, please? Yep. Excellent. Um, so um, we produce a travel line journey planner and we give out currently, well, in normal time, 60,000 odd journey plans a day. Um, and our national data set tells people when a vehicle is usually operated by a load for your vehicle when a service is. So we include that in our TNDS, which is Trans Exchange 2.5. Um, back in 2012, when the Olympics happened, the DFT spent a lot of money producing accessible stops data for London and the areas where there were big drop-off points for the Olympics. And we're really keen to use and, and to consume accessible data. And for us, um, the fact that it wasn't included in the statutory instrument, um, whereas we understand that it is a burden on local authorities potentially, but we strongly believe that this is what one of the things that customers require is how accessible it is. That's not every inch of the stop, but if it's got a curb or if it's got a riser, it can be accessed by a pushchair, a wheelchair, an automated um, buggy of some sort. So, so for us, as a major consumer of data, it is really important to us and we would like to use it. So just to put that in as a marker. Yeah, I think we, I mean, we'd agree. Uh, we think it is really important. And we, I should stress that um, some of the things that we talked about doing in the short term, those are the things that you will see tangibly because we're, we're going to develop them. But we are still doing research and work on the other things um, in, in parallel. So we are working um, quite a lot at the moment on accessibility just to try and get some cross DFT understanding about what do we mean by accessibility uh, and what information do we have and I think there's probably there's two things that need to happen one there's probably information out there that we need to try and get out to people as quickly as possible if it exists already um, which is quite tricky but also secondly we need to agree um, what the standard is for accessibility information to make sure that we're all heading in the same direction because it's a question that comes up in boards as well. And Mira's put a camera on as well, so I'm going to hand over to her for a second. I was just going to say one thing, Adrian, before I hand off before we hand off to Mira. Mm -hmm. um, the current NAP10 system, even if you gave it accessibility data, doesn't know how to work it and produce it out. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we're ensuring with the new system. If you give it data, it doesn't throw it away and it's able to produce it. So if we can. For example, if TFL is giving us accessibility data and we've not been able to capture it previously, that's something that we're looking at ensuring that we capture currently. So that is a bit of a blend and um, that's something that we need to test out with the downloading to see how we do that in a way that doesn't confuse the heck out of everybody. And I think it's just also um, worth making the point as well that when we talk about accessibility data, particularly in relation to um, NAPTAN and buses, um, there's almost two, two um, contexts to be aware of. So you've got the accessibility data about the buses and the vehicles themselves and, and the, the, the attributes, uh, which is particularly relevant to um, BODs um, and um, open bus data. And then you've obviously got the, the accessibility features of the bus stop. And, and the accessibility data within the NAPTAN data set too. And 
um, there's quite a close relationship between both both of those data sets and they're both equally important. Um, we absolutely support the need for better and more accessibility data, um, but it is just worth um, being aware of that difference between the two, the two data sets. I think really my point was about the Naptime data because legally bus operators have to operate their services um, with vehicles that have low floors or can kneel. Um, so that's the, that's the given now, unless it's a bus replacement and um, coaches are put on, for example. But really, it is about, I'm really talking about, and I understand the interaction between a bus being accessible and a stop being accessible, and it's really the stops that I was um, speaking to rather than the stops. Okay, right, brilliant, great, thanks, Julie. I think um, the reason why um, we picked it up is because it's also something that comes up quite regularly in the BOTS context too, as well, about bus vehicles and, and attributes. Okay, any more questions about map time? No? Okay. Um, more opportunities um, to, to ask questions and, and getting, get involved um, in, the, uh, in the groups that you can uh, find more about on the PTIC site and how to sign up for those. Um, I'm sure uh, Adrian and, uh, and Dr. J will be uh, welcoming uh, people along to those, um, both the planned and the unplanned, because it won't all end at the end of <laughs> Thursday, which I think is the last scheduled one. There'll be more coming up. Um, <laughs> by the end of it, yep. you'll all know more about that time than, uh, than you probably wished you ever did to start with. But uh, it is I, so important to, uh, I, to everything that we build upon. I'm not sure that point could ever come, Tim. But yeah, thank you very much for having us, and um, I hope, hope to see you at a meeting soon. Mm. Thank you both. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so um, after nap time, um, travel line. Um, Julie's got some uh, updates uh, for us. They're doing some exciting <laughs> things. Okay, I'm going to try to keep it reasonably brief um, in case any of you have got questions. Uh, so just two or three areas I was going to update you on. Um, the first one is our news that we will be merging with Plus Bus from the 1st of April this year. So the Plus Bus organisation, as you, you probably will know, is an add-on for as a rail ticket for accessibility uh, around the bus network within 280 locations in the UK. Uh, Jonathan, who has been managing it very well for 14 years, is retiring at the end of March. And the same people fund the organisations for Plus Bus, pretty much as they do for Traveline, with the exception of RDG, who also funds Plus Bus. So um, Plus Bus is not a company in its own right. It's an organisation that sits in as part of CPT. So our two organisations will merge, and the Plus Bus um, Stakeholders who aren't already on the TIL board will join from the 1st of April. Um, currently, we're going through the process of a handover from Jonathan, making sure that we know what we need to do every time there is a fair change. Um, this year is different. <laughs> um, there isn't going to be a real fair change in May, um, and plus companies can't put their prices up anyway whilst they're being funded as they are at the moment. So it looks like currently the next big change for us will be from the 5th of September, which is anticipated to be the next rail change. So what we'll do for the first six months is run as business as usual, learn how to use the system. But at the same time, we've set up a subgroup to look at what we can do, what more we can do, what more we can do with the ticketing um, availability as it is as a rail product, what more we can do with the brand and other ways that we can plus a bus onto things that may not be trains. So um, without sort of um, jumping into what we're planning for the next six months, because there's a lot going on, um, there's an awful lot of decisions that need to be made and funding that needs to be sorted out. But what we'd like to do is to grow the product further, um, to move it on to more e-ticketing, to start working more with it. So it's already available on it. So um, and to start looking at it being able to be let, read electronically, because currently you can only buy it um, as a paper ticket, which means it's not as accessible as it used to be by organisations such as Trainline, which uh, makes up or did make up 25% of the sales. So there's a lot to do, um, but I'm pretty confident we've got the right team. We've taken on um, a new open data um, person on our board for the first time, um, and that's Giuseppe Salazzo, who used to head up data analytics at the DFT. So he's going to come on our board as an advisory uh, board member, hope, hopefully moving to full board member from the 1st of April. So that's beginning to take into account um, much more 
the user aspects of what we do, whereas we, we already have a lot of um, open data users through the TNDS and our next process API. This kind of takes it one step further and looks at it from the perspective of somebody who's developed heavily against transport data, who has experience within DFT um, in terms of managing data analytics and also is a GDS assessor, which is like gold dust and very, very excellent knowledge to have on our board. So we're quite excited about that. Um, we're going to start reviewing improvements we can make to Plus Plus probably from about Q3, Q4 this year. But um, that is dependent on how well we move on with uh, taking data from VODs and how quickly we can move to the next version of 2.4. So I'll just move quickly on to that. Um, the travel line national data set was always there because we need a national data set for travel line. Um, we make it open and started making it open in 2013 because other people said they needed it too. And we continue to do that for free. Um, we are beginning to take data direct from bus operators. Uh, we take data direct from first into the TNDS already. Um, and we're beginning with Stagecoach this week, rolling out in the East Midlands, East Anglia and South East. Um, we hope that data will be live in the next two to three weeks. So we're already beginning to take data direct from the big groups with whom we have a direct relationship and we understand in quite a lot of detail where these software glitches are, where the data is good and, and where we can begin to move to 2.4, 1.1 uh, towards the end of the year. We'll be working with Neera and her team on being a data consumer report. So when the, um, I'm sure they'll talk a bit later about the validators that are going to be added to BODS to validate 2.4, 1.1, uh, I think around June, July time. So as soon as we've got more operators who are regularly updating that type of data and it's a stable data stream, many of us, not just travel line, will be able to take that data direct from BODS. Um, and there's quite a lot of work going on behind the scenes um, at BODS to help us to consume that data, to help us to audit what's on there and what isn't, um, and, how, and what the quality is like on that data. So we're looking forward to doing that later on in the year. Um, we've also begun um, looking at consuming the Siri VM, which is already published. Um, and we can start as soon as 2.4, 1.1 transit changes up there, trying to match that to the Siri VM. Um, the actual elements that allow you to do that matching are not present in 2.1 or in 2.4 version one. Um, part of that will be looking at the data we get from operators on capacity. Um, and there's a lot of um, talk about how well that works. And I know that Tim's running a workshop soon that looks at um, capturing capacity and how useful that data is. The most useful part of that into the long term currently is those two, three, four wheelchair spaces on that vehicle. Um, have, is there a wheelchair on there? Is there space for it? Is there space for a buggy? Because these are the questions that our customers have been asking us for the 20, 21 years that travel has been in place and they're still asking us. And we ought to be able to tell them by now. Um, so we're concentrating on um, looking at how we can make some sense without over promising of the um, capacity data for those particular seats, which is part of the Siri. VM feed as well. Uh, we think that's one of the big benefits of, that have come out of this quick um, production, if you like, of this data type. Um, in terms of how we deal with TNDS, at the moment we produce it um, several times a week in version 2.1 and version 2.5. The only difference for 2.5 is we add in a local flag for vehicles and we add in a national operator code. So there's nothing super clever about it. But it does allow us to show local or flag vehicles on our on our website and other, other people use that too. Um, we hope to stop producing 2.1 at the end of this year, but ahead of doing that, we need to make sure that people aren't still using it. We know at the moment that it's still being downloaded a lot. Um, we need to start to work with our open data users to see if there's still a need for that. At the moment, it just takes twice as long. We have to process it twice, that's twice as much processing time, twice as twice as much resource. So you know, and we don't consume 2.1, well, we haven't for five years, so it's for other people to use at the moment. So we'll be looking at um, taking that down if possible. Currently, the limitations on that are that, as I say, we've still got lots of open data users who consume that version regularly. Um, and the accessibility software that local authorities use, Track, can only consume 2.1 at the moment. So, and that's one of our biggest customers behind the scenes where they're not journey planners. So we wouldn't look to switch it off until we know that sort of in particular, can can take the new job for 2.4 version. Um, in terms of the um, travel line brands and services, there's a lot of work to be done on that. We got two thirds of the way through customer research this time last year before the pandemic started. Um, and the last piece of the research was to be sending out questionnaires and doing online interviews with people, finding out what they wanted us to do with travel line. 
And of course, that makes no sense to do that in a COVID environment. So we'll wait and finish that research and perhaps revisit some of the earlier stages um, when, it, when we're much more back to normal for public transport usage, or if we're not back to something that we think is going to be the case for the next two or three years, so that we can make sure our services on Traveline and Plus Plus are developed around what customers need rather than what we think they need. Um, because I think when you're quite systems focused, which we all tend to be, particularly on this call, it's very easy to forget the end customer is not the open data user, it's the person traveling on the bus potentially or the train or the or the or micromobility or however they choose to travel and however they choose to buy their tickets. So um, that work we hope to pick up again towards the tail end of this year. Um, you you will see from the Plus Plus website that it needs some love. Um, I think that's probably the best way to describe it. It's been very well maintained, but it's quite old in terms of its design now. We've also got a Traveline data website where um, data consumers can download various data sets and are signposted to various data sets. And that website will be updated too. So the Plus Bus, Traveline data and Traveline.info will all be brought into a similar kind of branding, um, similar kind of easy look and feel that's really going to be much less cluttered than it is now and hopefully um, make sure the user experience is much clearer than it is. Um, I think that's it for me, thank you. Unless anybody mm. has any questions. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Um, any questions for Julie? There's a lot going on in the travel line world. You'll be a busy lady over the next uh, year anyway. Yes, definitely. Yeah, we're checking on some new resorts as well, and we hope to be able to announce uh, the personnel who will be filling those spots in the next couple of days. So we can't, we can't do that now. Mm -hmm. I do have a question, Tim, but I did just want to say um, that one of the one of the main objectives within DFT and particularly one of the things that we wanted to drive through bus open data was greater bus rail integration. And um, you know, Julie already knows them, um, so we, we talked last week, but we just think this is a really great development to see travel line and plus bus merging and um yeah, I think rail bus integration will just be a, a quite a growing and strong theme within government. So um it's really good to know that um I think the industry's mindset is evolving alongside. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> I reiterate that. I mean, for the first time, those train operators that are putting in uh, display screens in uh, in rail stations with uh, bus information on. Um, you know, previously, it's always been local authorities that have been doing it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's beginning to beginning to show the work for on on integration um any we are questions? we are doing quite a lot of that work tim uh, if anybody wants to know more um transport api is uh, powering quite a lot of those um bus information screens on on stations now excellent excellent um i'm sure if you've got any questions um you drop julie an email and uh, she'll um uh respond to you yeah um, absolutely happy to take any questions by email as well yeah okay um if there's nothing else for julie then um we'll move on um eu standards development um at the moment um NetX development um, is is in one of these um, quiet phases with with international um, standards development. Um, there's a burst of work. Um, it then seems to pause um, for long periods of time um, whilst um, the the organisations do their internal reviews and carry out the votes for member countries um and that typically takes six to nine months um and then the new version comes out um and so uh, so netex um has has had that initial burst um the um schemas for it are available through um the netex website and on github but the documentation is just going through the the send review process and things like that um don't hold your breath um, because uh, six to nine months is an awful long time to have to hold it. Um, if you want to know how to use those schemas and things like that, then um, talk to um, 
I was going to say me or Nick, but really it should be the other way around. Nick Knowles or myself, because Nick's the real expert in NetEx, um, and uh, and he can uh, advise you more on the on the detail of that. Um, there are some changes to the um, to the fares profile for for the UK that are being worked on to resolve some uh, some challenges. Mira might pick up on those um, later. Um, I'll give you an update on Siri in a moment um, because that's in the middle of one of those busy periods um, before it all um, pauses for votes and things like that. Um, but um, the other bit that we've talked about before here um, is historical reporting and performance reporting. Um, it's the bit of um, the overall trans model architecture that doesn't have a, an implementable standard. So if you're planning things, you've got NetEx. Um, if you're wanting to look at things in a live environment, you've got Siri. What happened um, from a performance management or a reporting type perspective is the bit that's missing. Um, and there's a project um, called Opera which, as I say, we talked about probably about a year ago um, in in PTIC, um, is just beginning to, uh, to, to kick off um, at the moment. Um, there's a number of people in the UK that are interested in um, what's going on um, there. Um, but at the moment, we're looking for use cases for that. So if you've got... Um, reporting projects or that you know might be properly historic you know what happened a year ago um to a bus route um or um what's happening live in a control room um then um we're, we're after um information on on the use cases and what you're trying to do and achieve um, so that we can feed those in to that project so that what comes out of it is something useful. Um, so that's that. Before I go on to, to Siri, there's a bit of a, um, a mix up between myself and Mira about when she's available. Um, so um, I'm going to jump on the agenda to um, Bods um, now so that we can hear from Mira while she's here. Um, and she can give us an update on, on what's going on with BODS. So, Mira, over to you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for being flexible. Sorry, um, I'll have to drop off at three. Um, so, you can just do a few minutes quickly to update. But, Timony, um, so Bus Open Data, we um, last year delivered the digital service. Um, so, that was the find bus, uh, publish bus data service and find bus data service. And also delivered the regulation. So those um, two projects were complete by the end of year. Um, the regulations help are now enforceable as of the 31st of December 2020. And the timetables, basic birth and location data requirements, all enforceable. Punctuality reporting requirements become enforceable from the 31st of March um, of this year. And um, from a um, from a digital service perspective. So now the, the main focus has been historically we focused on creating data standards, building a digital service, and, and at the moment we're very much focused on building the, the free data sets that we need and making sure that the data quality is right. And um, so we've got complete data sets, they contain all of the attributes that we need, that they're accurate, that the data that's being provided is actually the data that we need, um, and they're up to date and they're being maintained and updated properly. Um, the timetables, we've got all of the big five now publishing their national data sets, which is really great news. And um, at the moment, we're measuring data um, in BODS at data set level. So we've got about 20,000 lines, but but not but obviously lines don't necessarily correspond to a service. And so um, one of the things we're doing at the moment is just um, mapping that to the ATC database to then um, identify the exact number of services that we have. But um, generally, we, we, we feel that we're making good progress with timetables, but the, the, the issues that remain to be resolved are getting those smaller operators to provide their data and also just really focusing on the data quality. 
Um, to improve the data quality, the Trans Exchange Validator is being developed. So that's for the, the, the PTI profile version 1.1. Um, so that should be ready March, April time, and then we'll hand that over to the technology supplier. They will integrate it with their products and services and have exports ready for the summer, as Julie mentioned. And we'll then ask the operators to start providing their Trans Exchange 1.1 um, PTI exports over the summer. And so we'll actually start, um, we, we're going to stop accepting Trans Exchange 2.1 very soon, actually. And at the moment, the majority of data that's in there, it's about, um, a, 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 I think it's about 95% of data in there is um, Trans Exchange 2.4, and then there's a little bit of 2.1, and we don't accept any 2.5. Oh. And we will actually start soon projecting 2.1. So all we'll have is 2.4. And then in the summer, we'll, we'll really start encouraging softly the operators to move towards 2.4 um, PTI 1.1. And then really by the autumn time, we'll actually start to lock that down and actually start rejecting files if they don't comply with the PTI 1.1 profile. So, so over the year, what you'll see is greater consistency and standardization of the timetable of data as well as completeness too. Um, from a location data perspective, uh, so just last week, National Express um, published their national data set for location data. So they've got 1,600 vehicles in their fleet and about 1,274 vehicles went into the national bus um, geospatial or live location data set, which was great news. And so we've got just under 14,000 vehicles giving us feeds at any one time to the, to the, bus, data, to the bus live location data service. There's 23,000 vehicles that are legally in scope across England. Um, at the moment, we're running at just under 80% service levels due to COVID. And so um, you can work on the assumption that at any one time, there's 4,500 vehicles that are just not actually in, in the fleet per se. And um, then obviously you, you won't always have um, you know, 100% of the fleet operating at any one snapshot in time when 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 we we can take a look at the data, and so we we are expecting to see after COVID and after the national lockdown lifts and we start to head back towards 90% uh, and then 100% service level, an increase in the number of vehicles giving their, their live location data feeds to board. But certainly at last count, we had 14, just under 14,000. So making good progress there. Um, we've had a little bit of feedback from data consumers. I mean, generally, the, you, the, the, the location data set is a new data set. Um, and so, so, so the data consumers are, are working with it per se. Um, there's a couple of fields that we'd like to see more. We, we'd like to improve the quality of that data too, to be honest. Um, and so in particular, um, the, so the vehicle journey ref data um, and origin aim departure time as well, two fields that we want to do a little bit of work on. Um, but you, you, that, that is growing. Um, and from a FERS data perspective, I, I think FERS data is um, just um, you see, um, challenging. Um, it's it's not, not insurmountable challenges, but there's a profile clarification that's required, particularly around first stages, which Nick is working, um, Nick Knowles is working on, um, and then we'll be able to, to, to give the operators some greater certainty around first data. Um, there is actually quite, there's quite a lot of first data, but I suppose one of the issues that we'll really need to work through with first data is how, how, how how the data consumers really want to work with the first data sets and, and, and that's something that will be a work in progress this year. So I think of all the data sets, this will be the one that takes the most time to both build up, get the quality right and, and, and present it to data consumers in the formats that they actually want to, to use to service in their apps, products and services. Um, punctuality data, so we are building a, a um, so um, essentially it's a location intelligence function for um, the regulators, for um, the central government, for the local government and also for the bus operators as well and that takes the bus live location data, um, so the geospatial data and then converts that into something yeah, useful and, and meaningful for, for, for operators. And, and the other groups and I suppose some of that was born out of if you think about punctuality partnerships and um, there was always this ability for local authorities to, to 
and Tim, you'll remember this from um, the, 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 the work of the earlier days in Autig, that you would put the kit on board the buses and the, the local authorities would have the, the back office systems and the local authorities could require or, or request that the bus operators provided their, their punctuality data to, to them for participation in punctuality partnerships. And, and, and technically they can, but there was always a problem in terms of the data never really being able to be presented in an interrogable format or in a format that the local authorities could ever really use. Um, so that's really the problem that the online bus data service solves. And what it does is it takes that bus ride location data, that geospatial data, and, and, and gives um, the regulators and operators some useful and meaningful reports on their live location data feeds and, and the extent to which they're complying and if there are issues with the quality issues with the live location data. Um, and then um, the, the, the second module is really focused on punctuality and on-time performance. And, and so that will look at both frequent and infrequent services and look at things like headway time, um, the, 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 the on-time performance of services, estimated wait time, etc. And that, that will really support local authorities and regulators and bus operators to participate effectively in punctuality partnerships and also particularly the smaller operators to meet their new punctuality reporting requirements. Um, the, the, the bigger operators and the medium-sized operators will probably have never had any issue meeting those requirements and being able to provide open data on punctuality but it probably would have been a bit more difficult for the smaller operators um, and then there's a third module which is a, essentially an enhanced data module and that will be able to be used by local authorities and um, operators and central government um, to again take the data from bonds and support policy development and um, network planning etc and um, so the, one of the reasons why I read that in this forum is just because um, there is obviously some represent rep representation from local authorities and we will start to make that service available um, during spring to local authorities and I think Tim you'll be supporting some of that work um, but if anybody does want access from, from local authorities to the service if you do reach out to us and we can, can facilitate that um, but the punctuality reporting requirements will come in from the 31st of March and um, the, 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 the analysed bus data service will be the mechanism by which to generate the punctuality data and then provide that to, to BOS and that will all be based on the bus operator's live location data coming from their own vehicles. Um, and so they're, they're probably the main updates. I think from a, 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 we've talked a little bit about occupancy data um, from an occupancy data perspective. Uh, this is still of um, interest and we are considering um, the essentially the optimal approach is in, in the absence of having any regulatory lever for occupancy data and what commercial model would work most effectively for the operators um, to enable them to, to, to share their occupancy data in a way that they feel comfortable. Um, and then more broadly, um, obviously we're, we're all working on um, the development of the national bus strategy and that contains within it a number of commitments around um, information and um, ticketing products. And so I think at Future Peter, if we'd love to provide an update on that. And um, the only other quick point I would just raise is um, the multi operator and multimodal ticketing block exemption. Um, so we are also about to commence a review of the block exemption. Um, so that will commence in mid March and we'll be completing that review in partnership with the Competition and Markets Authority and with FASE as well. Um, and, and for anyone who's not aware, the block ticketing um, exemption um, is in relation to the um, 1998 Competition Act. Um, so, so that prevents operators um, transport modes from colluding on price. Um, however, in where it's felt to be beneficial, operators can operate on price and, and in the context of multi-operator multimodal ticketing schemes it is felt that the benefits outweigh the risks um, so the block exemption exists for that purpose to allow operators to, to cooperate on price and, and revenue sharing for those schemes um, it's due for review and um, so the, the call for evidence will be published next month um, to review the, the existing exemption whether it's meeting its objectives and whether we need to change that and so um, we really welcome involvement and participation from the community and, and one of the, the, the angles that we'll be, be taking in the review is 
not only how it works at the moment in supporting the development of multi-op and multi-modal ticketing schemes, but also how it might need to evolve and work in the future to allow the new and emerging modes to be represented in those schemes. So, for example, um, e-scooters and cycle shares, etc. Um, and so, um, I know a lot of you are active in the mobility marketplace um, space and would really welcome your thoughts and contributions. And um, that's probably all you need to hear from me, I think, Tim. Okay, thank you, Mira. Um, are there any really quick questions for her? It's a quick one, Tim. Um, regarding, we have a we run a spotted uh, back office, and the ticket off uh, ticket machine supplier has mm -hmm. come back to us saying that they can't export to the NetEx at the moment. Is that alluding to the difficulties or challenges that Mira uh, made in her statement? Okay, um, so Ian, do you want to, would, would you be happy to just ping, ping an email over to the team and maybe provide a little bit more detail? Um, we'd need to know which operator and also what, if you were able to tell us the ticket machine supplier as well, and then we can start to look into it for you. Um, it's difficult to say at this moment what, what the issue might be. It's the whole, it's not just one supplier, it's the whole back office support. It's because we, okay. we just use the one ticket machine manufacturer to provide across a number of operators. But yeah, we'll put it in an email. Brilliant. Thanks, Ian. That's really helpful. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mira. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Okay. Um, so, um, as um, we're talking about Bob's um, as people start to um, actually implement things like um, the the PTI profile and and the and the Siri profile and uh, and the NetEx fares profile, inevitably there's questions that are arising and um, uh, updates to to FAQs and 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 the profile documents just to to clarify the areas where it's maybe not as clear. Um, if you've got any questions or any feedback about any of those, then please do um, let the uh, the Bob's help desk um, have those questions and queries, um, and they can work through them because uh, the last thing that that they want is is people trying to work out what something means when it's not clear. Um, because uh, if you've got a question, then it's probably something that somebody else has got a question about and uh, really what wants to come out of this is consistent data um, so if there is opportunity for for inconsistencies then uh, I'd be keen to try and uh, get rid of them and uh, and the Bob's team um, are I know as well um, so uh, so if you've got any queries like that then um, uh, do let the uh, the help desk know Feel free to copy me in if you want, um, because uh, the question might come to me anyway. Um, so, uh, any questions about bods or anything anybody wants to say? No. Okay. Um, we will jump back then to um standards um and i was about to bring you up to speed on what's happening with siri i think um so let me just uh share some slides so um at the moment siri is at version 2.0 um we're looking at um releasing siri 2.1 um the um xsds so the schemas um and the technical side of things is all hosted um now on github um so you can see at a very detailed level exactly how things are changing um so all of the changes since um 2.0 are 
on there um, and you can work through what's changed. Um, we are um, moving to um, a, um, a better approach to handling releases. Um, you'll have seen this before. Um, we're, we're moving to um, um, a situation where um, a major release, which has got breaking changes, so people can't use that version until they've um, upgraded software. Um, they will be major, so we would move in that case from version two point something to to three. Um, fortunately, um, two point one um, so far has avoided um, all breaking changes, so um, people can still um, use um, previous releases um, with with newer versions and vice versa. Um, so um, uh, that's good, but um, there is thought um, about a version three um, in the not too distant future, which in seven terms is probably um, two to three years. Um, so uh, so far enough away for most not to be too worried about it. Um, so um, the XSD, is on GitHub um, because the documentation are send copyright um, that can't be made available um, through Git or directly on a website. You have to get it from BSI um, in in the UK context um, or another national body if you're outside of um, the UK. Um, but what we're trying to do is put as much of the context um, and background as we can um, as changes are made to the schema within the schema. So there is less need for the document. Don't tell Sen, um, but um, we're, we're trying to do that, um, recognising that um, uh, people want to read what's in the schema and understand it rather than having to look at a um, three or 400 page document to understand it. Um, so, but that's going to take some time to work through, but all of the new changes are being um, documented within the schema itself. So what's changing in to 2.1? Um, we talked about this last time I talked about Siri updates. So uh, apologies. Um, there's quite a lot of hard coding in Siri at the moment between TPEG and DATEX and NETEX um, where um, there are codes um, to, to, to link the two standards. So for example, um, in Siri SX, um, if you're wanting to code a, um, a road closure and provide the reasons for it, um, then you might use a code that refers to the fact that there's an avalanche or there's a landslip. Um, that means that at, when TPEG and DATEX changes, um, Siri needs to update um, and these things never quite um, align. Um, and so we're trying to remove that hard link um, by um, getting rid of um, codes and, and using the uh, descriptive names um, because that gives more flexibility. Um, at the moment, 2.1 will support codes and names um, for that backward compatibility. Um, the, a breaking change would be to throw away those codes um, and only use names. Um, that, that's one of the reasons why version three is, is being thought about. Um, but 2.1 will um, include um, uh, codes and names to provide that, um, that continuity. Um, a big change which links to something that we've already talked about today um, is improving um, occupancy data at the moment. Siri um, isn't great for providing um, occupancy and capacity data. Um, basically, you can go the thing's empty, there's some seats and it's full. Um, 
and, and nothing more. So this was being planned before the pandemic, um, largely from a ticketing point of view, but um, we've taken the opportunity to um, uh, improve it um, significantly. So um, Siri will support not only the historical Siri stuff, it will support the GTFS occupancy um, categories, um, which are a bit richer than the Siri, but um, it creates some new structures that allow you to provide um, the capacity um, of a vehicle. Um, and when we're talking at that, because Siri is used in, in all sorts of different modes and contexts, um, that you can break down by um, carriage for a train or deck if it's uh, if it's a double decker bus, for example, um, as well as um, you know um, the class occupancy type arrangements where you might have to have a different ticket to, to sit in a particular set of seats. Um, so you've got that going on, um, and then we're overlaying. Um, the ability to provide the capacity um, in each of the carriages, decks, ticket type type things um, to enable you to um, play with that in real time. So as COVID um, guidance and requirements change, you know, you might be able to put more people onto a bus. Uh, you might actually have to reduce the number of people. So the seat capacity, um, sort of the, the planned um, that you can um, change um, the current seat occupancy. So as it's going past a particular stop, for example, um, you know, how many seats are occupied now? Um, and also um, the expected occupancy at a stop. So if you've got historical information that says, actually, there's always 20 people that get on the bus at the next bus stop, you can start to provide that to provide the view further on down the route that says actually it's going to be full. It might not be full at the moment, but by the time it gets to you, um, it's going to be full. Um, and um, picking up on the, the accessibility stuff um, that we talked about earlier, wheelchair occupancy, um, buggies and, and those sort of um, special areas um again you'll be able to to go actually the, that bus has got capacity for two wheelchairs one's currently full um and four stops down the line actually both are going to be empty or expected to be empty um so uh, so really providing a rich set of data for occupancy um one of the challenges that comes with that is is actually how can people really make use of that? So how do you get that passenger counting, that boarding or lighting data um, captured um, and then provided? Um, so uh, so there's some work to, to be done um, to be able to use these new data structures um, uh, now that they're available. Um, so that's occupancy. Um, other changes, um, Siri's not been updated for uh, about five years. Um, so there's quite a lot of implementation um, lessons um, that have been learned and the needs for um, some, some tweaks and enhancements as, as systems have got bigger. Um, so for example, if you're subscribing to, to data feeds, um, you want to be able to control how much data you get more tightly um, and that data to be a bit more targeted. So there's more filters. Um, you, there's improvements to, to subscription um, renewals. So um, the systems know who subscribed to what much more effectively and, and need less data at, at renewal. Um, there's some inconsistency in multilingual support. Um, important in the UK for um, Welsh in particular. Um, you can't always provide multiple languages in some of the fields, but that's been adjusted. Um, and um, 
there is inconsistency at the moment between um, some of the versions of some of the variants of Siri. So um, between um, stop monitoring and uh, ET, for example, um, there's some differences in the information you can provide about arrival and departure times. Um, that's important, um, particularly when you're adding in and removing stops in Siri ET for disruptions and on the fly changes. So improving the consistency of that. Um, uh, in the same way that NetEx um, has got new modes, so um, you know, electric scooters and bikes and, and walking and, and all those sort of things, um, they're supported um, in, in mode types in Siri. Um, linked to the occupancy stuff um the makeup of a vehicle and, and how how it's composited um is is included for the first time so that allows for particularly in the rail world um you know train sets to be changed on the fly so a carriage taken out or added two trains joined together that may or may not link between the two train sets and that sort of thing. Um, particularly important in some of the continental international um, trains. Um, and whilst it's not particularly important for buses, um, the whole way that keys and platforms um, are um, formed and specified um, is, is improving to, to give some more complexity. We don't often in this country have um, platforms on train stations where you've got um, zones um, where you may, you know, for, for boarding and the lighting that, 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 that change and, and, you know, you get platform A and B that's the same physical platform, but continentally there's, they, they often have more than, than just the two. Um, and, and have things much more complicated. So um, support for that is, is being improved. Um, it is useful for, I forget which ferry terminal it is in the UK, but ferries um, play a part for that as well. Um, other changes, um, vehicle fuel type, um, which is something that, um, was requested through PTIC, um, so you can track um, both the planned and the live vehicle fuel type. So, you, so for example, for low emission zones, um, you can track um, you know, whether it's an electric or a diesel vehicle in real time and, and what sort of engine it's got. Um, support for service branding and subcontracting, um, important for franchises, um, for example, um, where you might have um, a headline operator that subcontracts some journeys. And that's important to be able to present to a customer or but also for managing in a control room um, and making sure that subcontractor only sees their vehicles and, and not somebody else's, um, for example. Um, and then um, linked to that, but also um, the whole key type thing and the, the rail um, formation of vehicles, um, improving relationships between journeys, um, important for guaranteed connections, um, as well as breaking connections for delays and, and things like that. Um, so there's quite a lot going on. Um, there's a hundred and something change requests that have gone into um, Siri 2.1. Um, so um, pretty much all of the changes are finalized and merged into GitHub now. Um, there's a couple of um, tweaks that we're making at the moment to spelling and, and things like that to iron out those problems, but you can go onto GitHub now and, and see what's changing. Um, documentation, um, all five parts of Siri. Um, have to be updated and submitted um, to send between March and May. Um, 
that's then when you don't hold your breath while the review processes and votes are going on. Um, and sometime the end of 2021, I would expect the formal versions um, to be uh, available through BSI. Um, but um, once the documents are submitted to SEN and they're in a stable state, if somebody wanted to review those documents um, informally, um, then, uh, then I can make those draft documents available. Um, probably be about May time. Well, it'll have to be May time um, for all of them. But uh, for example, part one and two, we've got to get done in in middle of March for submission to send. So uh, so a bit before that. So if you want to see the drafts of the documentation, accepting that they're not going to be the final published version, but they'll be pretty close, um, then uh, then you can request them. So that's an update on Siri. Um, are there any um, questions on um, what's going on with Siri? Hi, Tim. Hi. I have one question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, hi, Alex. hi. Um, the versioning jumped at me as a bit odd. Um, I wanted to know why they haven't picked up something like Semba, which is a much better standard, I, I think. Um, yeah, it would be nice to be able to go 2.1.1 rather than 2.1a. Yep. Um, um, unfortunately, um, Sen doesn't understand that. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's because ISO don't understand it. Um, mm. But there is a there is a change going through um, the the ISO level, um, which will work down through to Sen in about 18 months time so um, i would hope that by the time we get to version three we'll be able to do it properly in the way that <laughs> that we would understand rather than the arcane way that he's done yeah, yeah i thought there was some legacy reason yeah that's fine <laughs> yeah 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 i've submitted a set of draft documents um using the the point numbering to to send before and it's been rejected so uh <laughs> i've got well told off for that it's very silly okay cool okay if there's nothing else um uh the um is the Peter issues log um there are two outstanding um change requests um that we've made um both about vehicle fuel types um the one for Siri um is um well in progress um and it's implemented in the XSD um and documented in the draft documents so that one will be nearly completed um Eaten linked to that is the need to have it in NetEx um, in the same exactly the same structure. Um, there is something in NetEx already, but it doesn't include all of the um, fuel types that, uh, that that are needed. So there's a change request for that. That one um, will be implemented in the next update to. Um, NetEx, which will probably be 2022. Um, shouldn't cause too many problems. Um, in the meantime, um, but uh, but long term, we need to just make sure that. So, so the Siri one will be closing down fairly soon. The NetEx one, we can't. Um, if there are any other changes that people think should be made to standards, um this is the way one of the ways that um make sure they get done and don't for, get forgotten um you know anybody can can raise a change request um and we can um put it through the uh through the processes um so uh, don't be shy about submitting them um, because you're the people that use these standards in real life um, and so live with the pain on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Hi, Tim. Sorry, it's Alex again. Um, That's all right. Yeah, the only thing that I think we'd like to see is that whether it's a low emissions vehicle or what the emissions of the vehicle are as opposed to the fuel type. So fuel type doesn't really give us much. Yeah. Yeah, they, there's been quite a lot of debate about um, that. The, the the challenge is how you translate that and mm -hmm. capture that in real time. Um, none of the vehicle manufacturers um, are allowing that to be captured off the uh, off the vehicle um, management network in real time um, at the moment. Um, <laughs> but those discussions are going on. Okay. Um, in one of the other uh, working groups so um the public transport group one which is all about on vehicle communications which has that vehicle to public transport system interface um is the one that's that's tackling that um uh, but uh, vehicle manufacturers want to control access to that data because they can charge vast sums of money to have that in a live feed um, into their back offices, um, but yeah, 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 we we're, we're aware of that one, but can't deal with it at the moment. But okay. will do at some point when uh, vehicle manufacturers um, uh, see the light, probably through somebody like TfL um, or Berlin, who are going to request it and make it mandated for an operator to supply them. Um, it's going to need one of those big people to uh, to to force the issue. Cool. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Um, Bod's issues log. Um, I've not updated that for a while because I've not had any updates to it. Um, Julie, I don't know whether you've, I don't know what's happening with the BODS issue log at the moment and uh, how that's been updated and managed. It's um, we've, it's frozen at the moment whilst we solve all the issues with um, Trans Exchange. So the DFT is concentrating on publishing um, Trans Exchange data um, and we haven't begun um, logging issues with the Siri VM or the um, Nest Expert data yet, but we expect to pick that up again um sort of in in towards the end of this year um most of the issues that have been raised so far have been addressed in terms of the trans exchange um there are still lots of open questions that we've all got about close school services being in the data um coaches other things that may be on bonds but um yeah we haven't started adding to the fares or to the um through VM yet because the user journey hasn't been um properly explored yet on bonds which Nero sort of said earlier so as soon as that restarts, we'll, we'll open up that document again. And certainly the next phase of the NetEx work, both for fares and for routes and timetables, will be in exactly the same format and the same kind of um, issues list format that we've all become familiar with. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I thought it was worth um, having a um, bit of a discussion about um, what PTIC should be looking at, what topics it should be covering, um, and uh, and and data formats and things like that. Um, and it's been a while since we had this discussion. Um, I don't know whether there's anything that people think we should be looking at and and talking about and sharing that we're not. Hi Tim, it's Ian again. Um, it's quite, is there anything we can do to look into the standard of mapping? The reason I'm saying this is we, uh, local authority, tend to use OS and we get the odd request, mainly from a local operator saying that the bus stop's in the wrong place or on the wrong side of the road. I'm pretty sure I discussed this one in Lancaster a year or two back on this forum. But we have another one again up in Carnforth. And to me, yeah, it's in the right place. You look at everything, it's in the right place. But the piece of software that the operator is using has to stop on the wrong side of the road on a one-way street going up, and it's causing the operator a significant amount of problems. But it's so far out. I mean, it's, it must be nigh on 10 meters out. So although the NAPTAN's in the right spot, we've been out there, spot checked it, 
what is there we can do? Is there anything we can do in order to get the software suppliers to improve the accuracy of the maps? Um, that sounds like a, a very interesting um, subject and one worth um, exploring. Um, Tim, the, um, it's really a question of which mapping is being used. Jonathan Raper here from Transport API. Modern Survey uses one set of um, mapping, but there's also OpenStreetMap. Um, and a lot of um, transport of operators and transport aggregators use OpenStreetMap because of the restrictive um, rights that Ordnance Survey apply to their mapping. So the first step uh, for you is to find out which type of mapping everybody's using, because um, that may well help you figure out where the um, where the problem lies. Um, can I can I just say, Neil McKinnon, at Stagecoach, um, it might not just be the base mapping. Uh, it could be if the data is being uh, transferred from one coordinate system to another and what that algorithm is uh, because Ordnance Survey, they've also got open data so you don't actually have to pay for much of it. So it depends if somebody's transferring from OSGB, the Ordnance Survey grid to that long. Depends what datum you actually use and which algorithm you use to translate from one to the other. And it's a kind of well-known issue, especially for an oil company drilling the wrong place. <laughs> Maybe that's something that uh, diesel owning uh, vehicle bus companies need to uh, start to do to drill your own oil. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, they're fair points. Um, is it so in terms of picking this up? Um, is it worth having a separate hour or so to, to, to work through um, some of the what some of the issues might be to, to then start to uh, to identify how we might help improve things I could yeah it could down. be I mean I, I came across an issue before when I first started at stagecoach um, we, we use trapeze and trapeze what um, doesn't have its it doesn't think in a real world, it's got its own coordinate space within the nuts and bolts of the system. Um, so whenever somebody exported from trapeze, um, it would export to, to lat long, but without a datum. So if somebody else tried to take it into Google, then you'd be about 10 metres out, which sounds like this issue. Mm. I think a lot of it also comes down to uh, how many decimal places they've, they've matched it to. So I think we've Actually, longitude taking you down to about one millimeter accuracy. It depends again how how far deep you've gone into the lat log. Whilst obviously an OS coordinate is the most accurate goes. Let's get to decimal points. I guess is one meter. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that comes down to. I mean, if you take it into Excel, Excel automatically trims your precision, so so mm. you're 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 automatically degrading the quality of your data. So yeah, it depends what software is kind of being used to shovel the the. the the data about the place. When you're dealing with your mapping data, you should also consider whether or not you can actually update or submit corrections on mapping data. Um, Ordnance Survey should uh, be willing to accept corrections if that's the source of the problem, um, but it takes you know some months for them to integrate it. Um, if it's Google, uh, just forget it, they'll never change it. Um, we've been trying to get things changed at uh, Heathrow Airport um, for years, and they've just ignored everybody. Um, if it's um, OpenStreetMap, you can actually do it yourself. You can actually log on and make the change yourself. Um, and if you if that's if that's incorrect, the community community may change it back again. But you can change it yourself, or at least ask the community to change it for you. So um, if it's not a datum issue, then it could be um, you know you you, you want to look into whether you can change it. On OpenStreetMap, and that might then propagate into suppliers' systems. Mm. Yeah, you know, I suppose the, the, one of the questions would be then to the operator that's having the issue: Is the bus stop actually embedded within the street map, or is it a, a point data set? So they've downloaded, you know, the stop CSV or something, and it's it's actually a vector layer in its own right. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, you, you need a stagecoach system in Lancaster in the north. And <laughs> this, so it's me and the problem. <laughs> yes, he didn't, he you didn't are, say so. that, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you got a question about the importing centre. Totally busted. Bizarrely, totally busted. For Jonathan, it's um, it, Google's actually got it in the right spot. So yeah, that's uh, a weird one. Um, so um, what I'll do, I think, uh, is two things. I'll I'll put Neil and Ian in contact with each other so they can um, uh, look at that individual one. But uh, but it it feels like a, a an interesting topic um to, to explore um particularly in light of the the work that dft are doing on that tan um to help um understand some of the real world issues that people have um using bus stops and maps um so it does feel like um it's worth having a uh having a session um on that to to then you know be able to produce quick note on you know if this if you see this then check these sort of things out um because that might help uh resolve them so uh yeah yeah that sounds like a good one Ian. something to uh to get our teeth into hi tim i think it's probably worth um well we spend a lot of time with open street map and open trip planner as well so it's probably worth considering those two in context because we spend a lot of time modifying roads and ro modifying sometimes rail stations or footpaths and things like that. So it'd be good if there was some kind of joined up thinking there between Open Street Map and then its uses, especially with Open Trip Planner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll make sure you're in on it, Alex. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is there anything else people think we should? be looking at and, and exploring? I suppose, Tim, we should just keep on the perennial topic of um, rail replacement buses. Still a Cinderella that nobody owns, neither the train operating companies uh, nor the bus companies because of their extraordinary, often one-off services. Yeah, I'm not sure, okay. I think they're not in BODS, for example. Um, you know, amongst a number of things that are not in BODs. So uh, it might be just worth keeping that um, in the uh, in the parking lot until we, when we've got time to look at it. Uh, they, these things always stay in the parking lot until you actually make time for it. Um, so um, I don't know whether um, with Plus Bus and Travel Line coming together, whether that might provide a a way into to a few new faces and contacts that that might be able to help yeah i mean i certainly think so i mean we're probably going to be looking at first i mean because plus plus ticketing in itself is extremely complex because it's not every operator and it's not the whole length of the service for any operator that serves the station so that in itself and its integration with rail to be able to make it so is exactly one of the things we'll be looking at um, and of course in travel line, we do have rail replacement data, but we get it from the bus, uh, we get it from rail data, and it's not the whole length of the service, it's usually just a bit, um, you know, it's just a, it's a short section. So there's rail replacement for when the trains aren't working, and then there's also the, the add on where you can get a ticket to the bus station that used to be a rail station, for example, viewed. Um, so, so there's lots of data in the, in the rail, and we are going to try and get to the bottom of that. And one of the things that the rail industry is doing at the moment is looking at replacing Lennon, which is his ticketing system. So that's kind of stalled a bit during COVID, but it was one of the things they were doing before that all started. Um, so that might that might help. But yeah, it's certainly one of the things that we're going to be looking at addressing because it's relevant to us for plus plus and for and for journey planning. Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. wanting to own it. I'm just saying we're going to be talking about it. <laughs> But you might get to know some of the right names in the rail industry that uh, that can that can help, or you well, think. Well, I might be able to persuade a couple of the rail industry people to be in this forum um, because they're much more into integrated ticketing now than they were two years ago, um, and integrating with bus. Even within the groups, we can see the same person representing both modes in two of the big groups now, which has never happened um, for us. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, excellent.
Um, is there anything else? No. Okay. Um, in which case, um, is there any other business? No. Okay. Um, uh, in terms of uh, next meeting, then, um, typically we've we've met three or four times a year. Um, so if we said we we're going to meet in three months' time, then that would take us to uh, the middle of May. Does that feel about right? Uh, I'll try and avoid half terms and bank holidays, which is always a peril. I can't promise to to avoid everybody's half term. Bank holidays, yes, but we'll do our best. Make okay. it another COVID update day. <laughs> that, that, that would be really a crystal ball. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The the last physical one we had was uh, was only uh, about a week before uh, we we're all told to stay at home. <laughs> yes, that was in Preston. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so we'll have a look at uh, dates in May then, um, and um, look forward to seeing you before. Uh, then if not before so thank you all thank you very much